word about Beloved Community Church. It was founded in 2000 as an interracial, uh, intentionally interracial congregation of the United Church of Christ. If you're not familiar with the United Church of Christ, it's not Church of Christ, which is lovely but very conservative. It's not Unitarian. Uh, we, the UCC uh, traces its roots all the way back to the Pilgrims and the Puritans, although we're usually apologizing for them, uh, and is the most progressive of the mainline denominations. It's a congregational-based sort of organization, so everything is kind of done at the local level. Um, there are a lot of good churches here in Birmingham. We are, we are genuinely diverse. I tell people we are black and white and rich and poor and gay and straight. Uh, young and old, cis and transgender, and people who come from every sort of theological and faith backgrounds and no faith background at all. We also are something of a social justice hub for the city. We host, because we have a very intentional commitment to justice issues, then we, ha we host a lot of meetings and sponsor a lot of meetings that are both, some of which are faith oriented and some, and some are not. Um, but we sort of continually offer an invitation into being in community with people who are different from you however you are. Uh, and with that invitation comes a lot of discomfort. Um, so I, I encounter, we are a small but mighty congregation because I, as I, a lot of folks say, I love what you're doing there, but that doesn't mean that everybody wants to sit around each week with people who are really different than them. Um, we've been in Avondale since 2000, and that's part of how I end up here today, uh, because we were in Avondale prior to the beginning of the gentrification push. Um, and we have been one of the consistent voices to say, but what about the poor people within the gentrification narrative in Birmingham? Uh, what about me? As the, the introduction was good, but I have also I'm a I have been involved in social justice work since I was in seventh grade, living in Washington D.C. Uh, I was a history and poli sci undergrad, so that's part of the interest that I bring to this, um, <clears throat> and in, in also a healthcare practitioner. My work in occupational therapy took me all over this city and really all over sort of the northern two-thirds of the state in both urban and rural areas working with all sorts of folks. I have lived and witnessed urban change in Atlanta, Washington, D.C., Houston, Seattle, and the San Francisco and East, uh, East Bay area, and spent time and watched urban processes in Mexico City and major cities in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, India, and Canada. So that's, I kind of bring a range of experience and interest to the conversation. Um, <clears throat> As a part of disclosure for social location, because I think that's really important, my own commitment to this issue comes from my faith. I happen to believe that we're all created in God's image and carry the spirit of God within us. And so my obligation is to care about all people and to work for the liberation of all people, most especially those that are, that are marginalized by our culture. Uh, and I stand as best as possible against the exploitation of anyone and against the exploitation of the earth because that's God's whole creation. That's the last bit I'm going to say about religion, but I, that's, that helps for, for you to understand where I'm coming from and where my commitment to this issue comes from. And I think for all of us in a question like this, identifying our own social location and what interests we bring to this is a part of the con an important part of the conversation. Um, <clears throat> I also live in the city of Birmingham. I live in Crestwood North and have been there for more than 10 years. Um, and have also lived in my 21 plus years in Birmingham and Crestwood South in Five Points and some in the suburbs of Homewood, Hoover, and Vestavia, sort of little short forays into the suburbs, but that's an important question too. Uh, I won't claim to be objective. I don't think there is such a thing as objective. I think it's about being aware of your own social location and how you're located in that and how that affects your perspective. So that's where I am coming from. Um, and I want to start by saying that too often our, con our conversations about gentrification happen in a vacuum. I would love to have this as a super interactive type of thing, and what I'm going to aim to do is leave time for questions and conversation at the end. But I'm also going to try to run through some background, because I suspect everyone in this room comes to this from a different place and from a different sort of knowledge level. So I want to run through some background that I think is critical to understanding questions about gentrification in this country. And um, if you leave with nothing else other than an overview about that, then I, that will feel successful to me. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about context. I want also to put in mind uh, the work of a woman named Mindy Fullilove. Has anybody here read Mindy Fullilove? No? Wow, OK. Um, she is a psychiatrist. <laughs> 
who also does public health work out of New York. I think she's currently at Columbia. She actually lectured here through a school of public health lecture several years ago about sort of urban determinants of social health uh, and or social determinants of urban health, however you want to phrase all those sort of buzzwords together. Very powerful woman. I'm going to recommend her work to you. Uh, for all of you in your public health uh, life. That's in fact, at the end, I try to conclude with a few suggestions. And one is to read everything she's written and look at everything she's videoed and written on, uh, on that's available on YouTube and other online sources. So she talks about a couple of things in a public health context um, that are going to be really relevant to what we talk about today. One is serial forced displacement. Um, which is the notion that people are pushed over and over again out of their home communities. Social disintegration. And planned shrinkage. So I'm going to put those sort of concepts social disintegration, obviously, of communities and of bonds within communities. Planned shrinkage is the idea that within cities, especially cities that are changing, you have an intentional drawing back of services at times. So um, I'm going to put those ideas out there just to kind of sit with you as you talk about these things. And she talks about the ways in which this has an impact on societal violence, on substance abuse, on AIDS and HIV transmission, obesity, and instability among families communities and individuals. So this also happens if we're talking context, and that's really, it's hard being short. If we're talking about context, that's really what I'm trying to do is set the context in, in the bigger picture here today. Because I think one of the challenges of any disciplinary connection is the ways in which we see very specifically, because we're taught to dig deep, right? Each of you has your own knowledge base, and I understand that most of you are nearing graduation, yes? Yes. Okay. So each of you is digging deep into the knowledge base of your own, of your own discipline and subdiscipline, but the broader context involves, involves all of this. And so we're looking at broader questions of context. So we're looking at this in the broader context of capitalism, right? I mean, capitalism at, th at this point is pretty much our global norm. And we're looking at an economic system of globalization. So we've got capitalism and specifically globalization. <clears throat> and within globalization, we're talking about unrestricted trade, and we're talking about government-subsidized, deregulated economic flow. And I would argue to you, and this is again where I won't claim to be objective, I would argue to you that this system exists for the accumulation of wealth for the sum at the expense of the many. So. Um, we live in a world where we look at the commodification of nearly everything. And this is deeply relevant to the gentrification issue. We're looking at commodification of experience, of life, experience, choices. So that we're talking about a situation where so often we are reducing our lives to economic transaction. Let's put a transactional, transactional theory. Okay. So that's, that's kind of our social cultural context, our economic context, as I would argue. Uh, and within this, federal policy, and especially for those of you who are in public health, the way public policy has an, intersects with this is really important. So Birmingham has been around since 1871, right? We're a relatively, we are a relatively young city. Post-Civil War, but p part of the very, it was founded as, a, with a, as an industrial basis, and it was founded on a very racialized basis, right? So if we have 1871 as the beginning, as of the 1920s, we have the beginning of city planning, and within city planning, we also have the beginning of racialized zoning. So we have the passing of legalized racial segregation as a part of Birmingham's zoning laws. 
so legalized segregation, not only in commerce, but, but in um, housing. That's where we're going. I heard, red, I heard somebody say redlining. That's where we're going with this. So from 1926 until 1951, legal, legalized residential segregation according to race was the law of this city. In, 1960, in 1951, it was ruled unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. It was actually already unconstitutional according to the United States Supreme Court, but the powers that be in Alabama decided to ignore that, create something that managed to, to hold the test of time for a period of time. And one piece of this, because of legalized segregation and housing in Alabama, one piece of this is that there has never, 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 been adequate housing for black people in Birmingham, or people of color. Back in this time frame, what we're talking about primarily is a black and white divide. It's more diverse, a little bit more diverse now. But there was never adequate numbers or quality of housing for black people in Birmingham, ever. So in this time frame, what you were talking about were segregated neighborhoods where people were limited to particular spaces, and there was never enough housing. So part of the push for this was, part of the push for the civil rights movement was people trying to move into housing in other parts of the city. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Let's talk about 1937. So we're t New Deal, Federal Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, New Deal. We have the homeowners Loan Corporation. So this is federal policy. So what I'm going, what we're weaving here together here today is local effects, local policy, and national policy. So the New Deal did a lot of work, a lot of good poverty alleviation stuff, a lot of a lot of vision of eliminating poverty that is and that has that has continued on through in some small ways until today. But the trick here, unfortunately, pretty much all of it was racialized. Pretty much everything there was designed for the benefit of white folks and not for the benefit of people of color. So the Homeowners Loan Corporation comes about as a way for trying to help keep people in secure housing. The problem is that it's, it's done along racial lines. So in a part of their efforts of risk management, which is not the word they use, but that's kind of the contemporary word, they created, a, they, they created something that we today refer to as redlining. So they color-coded neighborhoods to assign risk, for financial risk for individual areas for those loans. And so the, and they were looking at the desirability of neighborhoods. And if you were looking at neighborhoods that had older housing stock or that had people of color, or God forbid, both of those things, that was deemed lower than others. So if you're looking at the city of Birmingham, if you, and if you look, go back and you look at a map from this time frame, what you'll see, for example, is that Forest Park and um, Redmont Park, right up there on the mountain as you're about to go over into Mountain Brook, those, that's about the only green part of the city. As you come down further into the city, you'll see lots of little yellow pockets, and those little yellow pockets are the, are the areas that have been established as white areas through legalized segregation. And you'll see, it, and you'll see some, some places that are not particularly noted because they're commercial, and then you'll see a ton of red. And those red areas are places that are predominantly African American. And certainly those are areas that contain, contain most of the African Americans. So we have this, when you hear the term redlining, and there's some really good resources out there about redlining, it sounds like a, it sounds like a sort of a, it sound, it, it's hard to overstate the consequences of redlining. Because what you had at this essentially is this point is you've denied an entire group of people the capacity to, to accumulate wealth for their families and for themselves through homeownership. Prior to this time, there was no sort of contemporary mortgage system. 
So we're looking at the development of the, of the contemporary mortgage system where people can buy houses over time, which is one of the primary ways in which people accumulate wealth these days, right? You buy a starter home somewhere and then you sell it. You buy a home in a, you know, in a more expensive area and you raise your family there. And then when it, all the kids go off to college, you sell that and then you've got enough to buy a little something. You know, you're an empty nester, you buy a little something to, and you have some money to retire on. And over time, you've, built, you've accumulated quite a bit of wealth. So essentially, that is, deni that is denied entirely to an entire group of people in what's called redlining. Um, this comes in along behind this because the Federal Home, the Federal Home Administration and the v Veterans Administration, which ensure private loans, adopt these same standards. And then private banks adopt these same standards, too. So essentially, everybody who's involved in, making, in creating access to housing for people adopts these same standards that are based on racial segregation. As you might imagine, I'm here to talk about Avondale. The whole of Avondale was, red, was redlined. If you look at a map from, the, from that era, all of that, all of that area is redlined. So the ulti and there's another piece of this too. So if you have people, you've, you've denied people in this, in those who are living in these areas, which are the vast parts of a lot of cities, You've denied them the capacity to, to borrow money to stay in their homes, to borrow money to, to move elsewhere, to borrow money to improve their homes. You've essentially, and you've essentially at that point then rendered the property worth next to nothing or worth minimal amounts. And nobody's gotten, now nobody may have the money there though who lives there to buy that. So you've also rendered it so that investors, the people who have the money to buy that land are investors. So you'll see parts of the city where, especially parts of the city who are occupied by people of color, where that, the people there are mostly renters, right? This is how you get sort of the system of renting, because the people who are there uh, can't afford to buy that land, and it's owned by people who don't even live in the neighborhood. So you, not, only have you, not only are you displacing people from these areas, and limiting people to these areas, you're also creating a situation where the people who are, who are literally invested in the neighborhoods live somewhere else and have money and have other priorities. So they don't have a stake in the well-being of the people in the neighborhood. We add in the 1949 Federal Housing Act. Which leads to um, what we call urban renewal, and I will put that in quotes. So if you think about UAB, <coughs> um, just to the north of UAB, between UAB and downtown, or not even between UAB and downtown, between sort of the early parts of UAB and downtown, there was an entire low-income African-American neighborhood, long-standing neighborhood that had been there for many years. Um, <clears throat> through, the, through this Urban Renewal Act, which allowed land to be seized for highways, which is about to be relevant because we're talking about the building of the interstate system, and allowed land to be seized, seized for public use, you have the destruction of, let me see, it's 56, 54 blocks of low-income African-American housing between here and downtown. So approximately located right in city center, 54 blocks of African-American housing demolished to expand UAB. So we got federal policy that's building that. So UAB's presence is really complicated in all of this, biting the, biting the hand that's feeding lunch here for you today. Because UAB, UAB so as the steel and, steel and iron industry shrank in Alabama, UAB was one of the economic engines that's continued to drive the relative prosperity of this area, right? But at the point at which you create a university and create all of this is, look at all of this valuable land that's owned by something that doesn't contribute to the tax base, per se. So that's a part of the push, too. By having all of this land devoted to, to public sector university, you take it out of the private tax base. And you also bring in a lot of people here, most of, a lot of the relatively wealthy people here who, who, uh, who work for UAB don't live in the city of Birmingham. They live in outlying communities. So in some ways, UAB has been a wonderful presence for the, for the city of Birmingham, but it's also created other kinds of, of tensions. So you've displaced black people to create the university. You've displaced, you, you displaced 
uh, black people as you're starting to create um, the interstate system. That's 1956, Federal, Hi Federal Highway Act. And don't worry, we're going to get up to 2017. But you cannot under, I will say, you cannot understand what's happening in 2017 when people are talking about, oh, development, redevelopment, is that good? Do we love, I mean, I love post office pies. Do we love post office pies and Avondale Brewery? And I love Avondale Brewery. And I, you know, I love all these places. Do we love all these things? You cannot understand what's going on in Avondale if you don't understand this. And you cannot speak fluidly into that conversation, which is also a public health conversation if you don't understand this part. So the Federal Highway Act of 1956 is the creation of the interstates. So theoretically, there was a, there was a civil defense part of that. Well, this is back in the Cold War. We're, t we're worried about evacuating cities because of nuclear threats and things like that. But you know what this does? This literally paves the way to the suburbs. So this is about money, too. Because this whole story is about money. So you, what you have going on, if you come back to here, let me write never as our, as our reminder. We've never had adequate housing for people of color in the city. Never had enough housing. We have pressure. We've had the, the, the technical end of legal segregation. We have housing pressures in Birmingham that are pushing people of color into the edges of neighborhoods that have been traditionally white, and we have what's known as Bombingham. Anybody heard that term? Yeah, okay. So we, every, I know folks have heard, likely heard of the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church, the, the tragic death of the four little girls there. But that was actually one of at least 50 bombings, 50 bombings that took place in Birmingham between 1947 and 1966. 33 of those were in a particular neighborhood known as Dynamite Hill which is part of the Smithfield community, which is just west of downtown. It's now bisected by I-2059, just west of the I-65 interchange. So this, these, tar these were areas that were targeted because black families were, because they had nowhere else to live, were pushing into, encroaching into what had been traditionally white neighborhoods. And the bombings were directed at these families that were trying to find adequate housing. So you've got all of these pieces of, all of these things coming together in sort of a cauldron of tension within the city. And then you have the opening up of the suburbs. And you have the capacity for real estate developers to make a ton of money. In 1950, the cities of Hoover, Vestavia Hills, Gardendale, Alabaster, and I know there are others, were not, were not even on the map. I mean, you know, there may have been people living there, but none of them were incorporated cities. The, and actually, the interstates through the city, through Birmingham, were not, didn't begin to be completed until 1970. So you see how all of these things start to come together. You have the push. I'm assuming, does everybody, is everybody here familiar here a little bit with kind of the tensions of the 1960s here in Birmingham? You know, we're... The push, the push for desegregation of stores, you know, water hoses downtown, Kelly Ingram Park, the whole, that sort of history. So you're right in the mix, mix of that in that decade. And you're looking at people of color trying to move into areas so that they have adequate housing. You're looking at people demanding equal and civil rights. Um, and you're looking at a white population that's freaking out because all of a sudden they're having to actually be in close proximity to black people with a shift of power. This is always all about power. So the city of Birmingham begins to shrink its amenities rather than integrate them. In 1961, they closed public parks and public pools. You also see the beginning of, of uh, certain private schools all over the city. And if you look at the population of Birmingham in 1960 and the population of Birmingham today in the city proper, the, the population has dropped by over 100,000 people. So over 100,000 people since 1960 have moved. Now, the, the metropolitan area as a whole has grown. We have over a million people in the metropolitan area. 
But we had it was something like 380,000 people, and that's approximate in 1960, living in the city of Birmingham proper, and it's more, it's 220 odd thousand now. So it's a huge shrinkage. So as you come on along, you've got 1970s, you've got the increase in the growth of UAB, you've got the increase in the interstate system, you've got white flight to suburbs every which direction. And you also have a growth in black political power because you finally have enfranchised black citizens who are able to vote here in Birmingham. And you have some white folks who are beginning to get a, get a clue that they need to sort of buy into this. You have the growth in the neighborhood associations and, and all of this. So you, get, you do get a shifting in what power looks like to some degree, but keep in mind that the big money in Birmingham is still white. And that's true to this day. We have sort of something we'll call multicultural neoliberalism. Can you all see back here if I write this? Does everybody know what neoliberalism is? Okay, so if neoliberalism is an economic system that values, <laughs> this is a shorthand definition, but values the accumulation of capital over the well-being of people, you begin to get a system where not all of the faces involved in this are white. Traditionally, it has been, but now not all of the faces involved in this are white. And so everything becomes much more sophisticated as you start to shift this so that you have people of color who have power, but who are still more interested in the accumulation of capital than the public well-being of the whole. Uh, this kind of culminates as you move towards this, you look, at, you look at the Reagan era, which I was alive for and some of you may have been. I've been told I need to not write over here, so forgive me. Is, this, is there another board? No. Okay, so Reagan era, 1981 to 1989, in terms of actual inauguration. So in, you get a real intensification of the starving of the federal government with a slashing of the tax rate, which leads to huge deficits, which then justifies slashing spending and particularly a slash in federal funding to cities. And that moment, truly, I mean, this is something that's been building, but that is the moment truly when you get an intensity of pressure to cater to the wealthy in a city in order to increase the tax base rather than the broader concern for the public good. You get also, you, begin, you get the beginnings of the deregulation of the banking and finance industry, which sets the tone and the stage for the foreclosure crisis of the 2000s, which, a lot, which many of you may remember, because we choose to bail out banks rather than people in that time frame. Um, 1992. Just to say, so if anybody thinks I'm just, just uh, being harsh on Republicans, we start, this is certainly, this is the first George Bush and Bill Clinton era, we have the Hope Six program. This is what really sets the stage directly for gentrification in Birmingham and the ongoing process we see here. So Hope Six is, is a, quote, redevelopment program for public housing. Um, it took... Birmingham, you know, Birmingham, sometimes things run behind a little, right? We, we're not always cutting edge about stuff. So it was 2002 before we got the redevelopment of something called Metropolitan Gardens, which is in downtown Birmingham. Anybody here remember Metropolitan Gardens? Anybody at all? Okay. Metropolitan Gardens was a public housing complex that was in downtown Birmingham. Um, it's now where there's a, there's a, there's a, a multi-income development called Park Place there now. So if you know, do you know, does anybody know where the downtown public library is? Okay, so kind of west of there, going back towards Red Mountain Expressway, they're now kind of townhouse style. So that whole area there, several blocks, it's between 5th and 7th Avenues and like 22nd and 26th Streets roughly, next north. Next to Jones Valley yeah. Teaching Park. Yes, next to Jones Valley. So kind of if you, took, if you kind of draw a line between the downtown public library and Jones Valley Teaching Farm, you had, that was, there was a huge public housing complex called Metropolitan Gardens. 
And it was commonly people, one of the sort of justifications for getting rid of Metropolitan Gardens was that it was, what is, is that it was considered one of the poorest zip codes in the whole country. And that had to do with the fact that it was practically the only residential land within downtown Birmingham. So Hope Six was the program, was this sort of program, and it was controversial and rightly so, and continues to be till this day, um, of redeveloping public housing as multi-income housing. So that you you introduce the idea was is that you would diffuse the concentration of poverty in a given area. But what it meant, and let me look at let me get my numbers right here. So Metropolitan Gardens. This is in 2002, and there had been some controversy over this, and I was involved in some of that back then. Metropolitan Gardens was a 910-unit public housing development. It was built in 1940, and it housed 2,500 people in right there, centrally located in the city. So if you're looking to get to jobs, if you're looking to have connections, you have that. When they rebuilt this multi, they tell people whenever they do this, and it's happening in Southtown and Lubman Village right now, and will happen, and it's happened, it happened in Inslee, it's happening in Southtown and, and Lubman Village, which is in Titusville right now, and will happen in other public <laughs> housing developments. Happen, it's happened all over the country, too. I mean, this is when I first became aware of this, was, in the, was right at 1991, actually, in Houston, when they were uh, looking to redo a place called Allen Parkway Village, uh, if anybody's got any connections to Houston. Uh, and also in Atlanta, prior to the Olympics, uh, they just uh, took down all sorts of public housing and, uh, and redid that then. So, okay, so Metropolitan Gardens had 910 units, 2,500 people. They told everybody, that, oh, you'll be able to reapply for housing. Now, keep in mind, this is a community that's been here since 1940. Now, people have different opinions about the question as to whether people should be living in public housing long term or not, and I'm not even going to go there today. I have some opinions about that. But you, when you live with people for a number of years, you develop community. And the fact of the matter was, in this place, there was a fabric of community, at least among some people. So out of that, 60 people who were residents of Metropolitan Gardens before it was demolished and put in Park Place, got, uh, obtained housing in Park Place. Others were moved around the city to different public housing complexes, but at that point you've disrupted, not, you've disrupted community fabric and you've disrupted people's lives and jobs. And how many people know what a wonderful system of public transit we have in Birmingham? Okay, we all know that, I mean, this is, okay. And if you look, for example, right now at Southtown, and I hear some of this has changed, but I, don't, I think it's changed simply just because of some other logistics. Is it, do people know where Southtown is on University Boulevard right next to St. Vincent's? So very centrally located. So they are looking to redevelop that, and they were talking about moving a significant number of those people out to the Oxmore Valley. Do you know where that is? It's off of Lakeshore. In fact, it's behind Lakeshore. <coughs> So imagine that you've been living over here for a number of years, and this is where your community is, and this is where if you're, you know, I've known, I've known people who live in Southtown. Some of them are working in places, like, for example, somebody might be working at St. Vincent's. Imagine being relocated way down Lakeshore. What's that going to do to you? Okay, so that's an example. And some of that, some of that is, is changing, you know, as we speak. But that's, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. So there are currently... There are currently a total of 471 housing units at Park Place. Some of those are market rate. 197 of those are below market rate. Because they, they have kind of a, a, a tier, a staggered tier. And 97 of them are low income. So in downtown Birmingham, downtown centrally located Birmingham, we've gone from 910 units of, of affordable housing to 97. So you've destroyed the fabric of an, of, of an established community there for the purpose of clear, clearing up the area. You've paved the way for downtown redevelopment ranging all the way from uptown, right? Everybody, people know where uptown is? I never have quite understood, given that like <laughs> the area where that new Publix is is called Midtown. So I'm like, okay, so we've got South Side and we've got Downtown and we got Uptown on the other side of you got. So we got that's very Birmingham. We got Midtown and then Downtown and then Uptown. Anyway, 
Um, you know, so but the loft district, like none of that was there. The, all this sort of loft district development, all the sort of bars, um, the whole Second Avenue restaurant row or Urban Standard and all, you know, lovely places. Um, and the entertainment strip along there and in uptown. All of that has come about after this sort of change of metropolitan gardens. And a lot of us mark this in 2002, which is the actual demolition of metropolitan gardens, as the beginning of gentrification in Birmingham. It was happening elsewhere already. Um, again, there's been a redevelopment in Inslee, and it's kind of interesting in Inslee, the redevelopment of the housing there has kind of gone ahead of some of the other stuff that they're doing there. Uh, but what you're seeing with Lubman Village over in Titusville and with Southtown right now is very much right in the mix of this. The Titusville thing is really is interesting too because that has to do, we've got, you know, Birmingham is supposed to be getting the World Games here in um, 2021, something. Yeah, it's coming up soon. And so you're, you know, this is, if you are in a space to where you can watch this happen and perhaps speak back into the narrative. What's going to be happening in Smithfield and Titusville and sort of all of this area that, uh, around Legion Field is something to watch in the years ahead. Um, Titusville also, because it's this area, this, and if you, if you don't know where Titusville is, it's kind of to the west of the UAB boundary, but directly west of the UAB boundary. Very low in, some of it is very low income, but historic black neighborhood in Birmingham. Um, that is an area that UAB has always kind of had an eye and an interest on. And you've got a mix of, of sort of uh, um, industrial type development and residential development there. Um, Railroad Park is kind of another interesting example. Railroad Park was built in 2010, public-private partnership. It's a lovely place, isn't it? it? Really is. It's beautiful. However, to build that, there used to be a whole, whole giant group of homeless men and very low-income non-homeless people who gathered on the corner there of, um, what is that, 13th Street, right by the railroad tracks where that, sort of that far end uh, that used to be kind of what was called the catch-out corner. So that was where homeless, homeless men would go to pick up day labor. And, and people who needed to employ day labor knew to come there. Uh, and so there was a whole sort of small residential community of homeless people in that space. And that was also an area where they could pick up work for the day to get some, you know, get some money to cover some of their basic needs. When Railroad Park stuff started, they just shoved those folks right off. Um, and this sort of continuing question of how you deal with the homeless population who are located around areas like the Firehouse Shelter, um, Church of the Reconciler. What Jimmy Hill U Mission used to be downtown and it's now been moved. It's funny, given the way <laughs> development is going, I suspect the people who helped to push Jimmy Hale out of downtown wish they probably, were probably gonna wish they'd push them farther um, because they actually kind of sit in this corridor between downtown and this east side development that's going on like around because the Jimmy Hale mission is now over right near Sloss Furnaces which is another kind of little hub of some development that's going on. Firehouse is going to be pushed out west. Yes firehouse that's yeah so this is so really here's the question in all of this all of these all of this type of development is wonderful yes Birmingham needs city services Birmingham needs a tax base post office pies is awesome avondale brewery is awesome saturn is awesome melt i love grilled cheese you know all of these things are good but what about the poor people what about the poor people what about the existing residents in any sort of given situation so let's talk a little bit specifically about avondale um avondale everybody know where avondale is no. i heard a no okay so if you go, if you go it's okay if you go so if you go so where we are here in south side this is, uh, we're on, so what University Boulevard is essentially 8th Avenue. So if you go six blocks south, or six blocks north, excuse me, towards downtown, so kind of like say the other side of Children's Hospital, kind of down where, everybody know where um, region the, the ball field is? Okay, if you go to the ball field and then you go, all right, I'm facing the right direction, this way. So if this is at, if we're at 16th Street, 17th Street right here, and you go out to 41st, so a couple of miles that way, a couple of miles east of downtown, 
41st Street is the main sort of business stretch that runs through Avondale, runs into Avondale Park. There's a spring there. That was actually, Avondale was actually on the stagecoach route that ran east to west because people would stop at the spring that in Avondale Park that feeds the lake there. So that's, a, that's sort of a long established area. And gradually there was some business right around there. Apparently there was actually a, a minor skirmish during the Civil War when, some, when soldiers from one side stopped there to water their horses and somebody shot somebody. The only, body, only person who got killed was the wife of the man who owned the land. But um, that's, that's a, we, we could talk gender and war a whole different day. Um, but, any, so there, but there was a mill. So, you know, Birmingham's mostly extractive resources like coal and steel and all, but there was a, a large textile mill in Avondale that was actually set on, over on First Avenue North, and that's kind of where that was the locus of development for that. Um, that mill ultimately expanded some different areas, but the whole property was torn down around 19, in the 1970s. But that was kind of the basis of Avondale's initial growth and of the businesses around there. Um, and actually, interestingly, it was known, although they did employ child labor because that was the standard of the time, overall that mill was known for fairly progressive policies overall. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, that whole area was completely redlined. There have been black and white folks in that area, but over time with white flight, all of this process that we've talked about, it became pretty run down. The commercial district was relatively empty. Church, that's part of why the church, and again, tiny little church with not a lot of power connections, was able to buy what had been an old Masonic Lodge, two-story building, old Masonic Lodge in, in 2000. Um, so, centrally located though, very convenient spot both for downtown and as you go just to the south, you hit South Avondale, which has always been a stable, uh, predominantly white community. And you get far, and then you hit Forest Park and Redmont Park, which are the wealthiest areas within the city limits. Uh, city decided to do, redo Avondale Park, and um, along about that time, a couple of young investors who were brothers bought some property down there and started Avondale Brewery, which is actually on the corner next to us. Uh, and from there, those guys had some initial success with that, and they started buying up other properties and started fixing it up. And all of a sudden, we have the hippest young professional urban playground in the city. Um, during that time, our street has lost its laundromat. Um, it's gained a bunch of nifty little places to eat. It's lost a significant stock of low-income housing, and it has gained uh, in, in this area, it has gained some refurbished apartments that are now renting for substantially more than they were, um, which has been part of actually, I think, I think we could argue that there's a citywide upward push on rents that's being driven by this area right around UAB uh, and is being driven by Avondale and sort of this and Lakeview and that kind of stretch in between. Um, you still have a significant home, homeless population in the area. Birmingham's homeless population kind of groups in different areas. So there's the whole kind of downtown crew. You have folks who are, who are receiving services at Jimmy Hale that come over to Avondale. And you also have, there's a crew of guys that live in Homewood Park. Some of them come to my church. Um, and so they're, they're kind of trying to sort of move around in there. You cross the railroad tracks over into North Avondale and you have the Tom Brown housing projects in Kingston and that area, which is still a an area of concentrated African-American low-income poverty um, that has had, upon which the powers that be have their eye for redevelopment upon that area also. All sorts of powers that be have their eye upon redevelopment of that area also. So I would argue in part nothing has been done in those areas to lift those areas up because people have other plans for that area that do not involve necessarily the, the interests of the residents there. And that's the real key. You can redevelop an area and increase your tax base for the city, but what are you doing for the people that live there? Why don't you start with the people that live there? Why don't you start with the people that live there? Even in East Avondale, and if like Beloved sits on the East side, by sitting on the east side of 41st Street as we do, we are part of the East Avondale Neighborhood Association, which is this little sort of chunk of land that stretches back over. It includes the Continental Gin, Old Continental Gin Building, which is where Cahaba Brewery is, if you know where that is. It's back through there. It sort of stretches on all the way over to the little, to, uh, 
was it CGC, the, the actual still existing kind of uh, steel mill there. But um, that, that is an area of older African-American homes. Those are people that have been in that neighborhood for years and decades. Probably roughly, used to be about 1,000 people. It may be a little bit smaller, predominantly African-American. And everything that, everybody that's moving into that neighborhood is trying to build up nifty new white young professional housing apartments. People and the, the, the people that, if you show up at a neighborhood association meeting there, the, the handful of older African American women who live in that neighborhood and a few African American men who live in that neighborhood know exactly what's going on and they're trying to figure out how to protect their neighborhood because they are due to be displaced out of it. Some of them own the land that, you know, some of them actually own their houses, but others are renters. So one of my particular interests is in seeing that those people can live out their lives and have that neighborhood preserved as it is. But that's going to be an, that's going to be an uphill battle. Um, the city, so Rev Birmingham. See, I get to say all this stuff. Rev Birmingham is a public-private partnership by the city to redevelop areas like Avondale, Woodlawn, Inslee, Norwood. <laughs> Interestingly, most of the areas targeted for redevelopment are areas that were white, lost their population to white flight. But there's still sort of this historical memory there, even though they're now pr predominantly, those spaces are occupied by low-income African Americans. Those, there's still sort of this historical memory of those, of recapturing those areas, of re, you know, redeveloping those areas for what was, quote, lost there. Never mind that there are people who are living there who've created their own community there and who would probably love to live there in this housing that is, you know, is, is um, centrally located, is relatively convenient to public transportation. A lot of it's beautiful historical housing that they haven't had the resources to keep up or even to purchase. So those are, um, that's kind of the situation in that area. Um, and that's not meant to discourage anybody from enjoying <laughs> Avondale and, and what's there but it is about raising the questions of, of what people can do. Um, I'll throw out a couple of different kind of things in terms of what people can do, because um, we're getting close on time and I want to leave a couple of minutes for conversation. Um, there is an ongoing conversation about gentrification. I can't even remember what they've retitled the committee now, but they're meeting tomorrow. There's, they had four public input meetings. Okay, so if I've just named here some of the central locations for, for uh, gentrification pressures and in the city, downtown, Inslee, Smithfield, um, Norwood, just north of downtown, East Lake and Woodlawn. Kind of interestingly, if you notice, look at this little potential for a white corridor, a little gentrified white, mostly white, with enough diversity to make it, quote, hip and interesting to run from essentially from downtown Birmingham all the way through the east side, right? Because we're talking contiguous properties going from downtown Avondale, Woodlawn, East Lake on pushing towards trustful. Um, so the first two public meetings, one was out at, was at Lawson State, which is way out on the west side, has a, bus that, has a bus that runs there about once an hour and is about 15 miles from downtown. The second public meeting was at Jeff State. Does anybody know where Jeff State is? Way out past Tarrant, there's also a bus that runs there about once an hour, and it takes a good hour, on, you know, a good time of day to get, let alone during rush hour to get out there. It's like the meetings were like at 6 o'clock at night. The meeting tomorrow night, today's Wednesday, right? And the meeting tomorrow night is at the Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Also a hotbed of, uh, yeah, I used to work at the Botanical Gardens. It is actually part of the city of Birmingham, but not exactly your well-known hotbed of gentrification questions. The fourth one is sometime in November, and I think it's actually going to be downtown, maybe at Boutwell or something. But anyway, those are meetings that are around. Um, a quick list, and I'm going to go through this quickly. I would argue for all of you this is relevant because gentrification is a global phenomenon, and there are all sorts of texts out there about gentrification wherever you go. Gentrification is a local application of globalization. And it's about making, it's about, it's about money. It's about how people move money around land. That's the real heart of gentrification. So, running down a quick list, always, always, always look at power structures and the, and the greater potential effects of the policies that y'all are involved with. Treat people as subjects in their own stories rather than as objects. Question the received narratives you're getting, especially about any particular geographical area. Geography always matters, and it's always connected to power, and it's always connected to people who actually live there and inhabit those spaces. Um, 
Dig deeper in your search for patterns, particularly when it involves marginalized people. Always look at the social determinants of health. Look up everything this woman has ever done, and that will lead you into other kinds of places. Fight for public spaces in the public sector. Work against your own interests when it's the right thing to do, particularly when you're coming from places of power and privilege. And by the very fact that all of us are in this room, we have some type of power and privilege. Some of us have a lot more than others. Interrogate all of the narratives of commodification because we are, we are living in a world where, we are, where the roles of people are constantly narrowed into economic terms, and particularly for many of us, the role of consumer. Keep learning and look for programs that help people where they are and push for policies that help people where they are in their own communities, that, where they are woven into the fabric of life and that preserve their communities and their community culture. There's a ton of good reading. I mean, this is all wrapped up in race. It's always a racial narrative. There are, there are cities around the country, and this is happening some in Atlanta, where there's, there's a significant black uh, middle class and power, and power structure, and they're less, to a lesser degree in Birmingham, but particularly in Atlanta, where it is people of color who are displacing other people of color, so it's more of an economic narrative, but it's always wrapped up in historical structures of white supremacy and this kind of stuff. The, I mean, this is, this is out and outright racism that was codified in law and policy, and that is what is being played out in our communities today. And so, you, you know, it's, that's not to say, you know, and we're all looking for places to live and we're all looking for places, ways to make a difference. But those are all things that we can pay attention to. And wherever you end up after you graduate, congratulations on that for all of you, wherever you end up, please continue to, to engage with this. And, it's, and they all have massive public health implications because your public health, because the health of any community, any given individual is going to be wrapped up in this.